Again, with the audio forgiveness begging of you. Ah, betrayal of the highest order. Hello, and welcome to Movie Phone. Actually, welcome to Betrayal Phone. Ugh, I know last time we spoke, I was like, guys, I'm gonna get in the grind and really start cranking it out, man. But that was before the most recent set of setbacks, which just keep, the hits just keep coming, folks. The hits just keep coming. But you know what? I'm like one of those, here's a musty reference. <laughs> those, those bouncy clowns that like have a rounded bottom, weighted, and you'd punch them and they'd just bounce right back. Yeah, way to mess up a good one-liner. But I'm like that clown. Can I take more than that? Keep me down, bro. Well, I guess just a needle in the case of the clown. You know what? That's a good metaphor. Keep your needles away from me. Just in general. Unless you're talking about all the buttons that my dog chewed off. Because in that case, those needles, you know, the threading kind, the button reparation kind, yeah, those are welcome. Yeah, I really lost the plot here. Well, folks, so it goes. Full steam ahead, you know, and if a few precious plots get ruined in the process, then so be it. Because this show must go on for the sake of humanity. As the world keeps crumbling around us and the list of allies grows smaller and smaller, still I venture forth and carry on. And again, I want to apologize. Uh, I have not been active. I have not looked at any comments or anything in the past few weeks. I've been very preoccupied with uh, another preoccupation that is all consuming. But one day I'll get around to it and I will react accordingly. Probably with a uh, humbled heart and tone, as so many of you are very kind. This survey doesn't talk about any of that. It ain't about me. It's about Connecticut. And this is bridge number 04619. No lie. Spanning 10 Mile River at Village Hill Road in Columbia in Connecticut. Right? Is it significant? Well, the survey seems to think so. In fact, it seems to think so in the form of nine pages. Oh, well, you know, see here, this little H-E-A-R, you know what I'm saying here? Here's a little pro tip if you haven't figured it out yet. H-A-E-R is not historical Milton building survey, it's historical American engineering record. The letters don't even write on it. So, that's where we're at. Which means this survey is in its waxing or waning... Is it waning? Waning hour. This bridge is owned by two towns, Colombia and Lebanon, which <laughs> also double as other nations. But for the sake of this survey, and for the sake of Connecticut, they are towns. Now, this is a small structure, as you can see, technically owned by the two countries slash towns that I just named. Well, really, it exists within the town of Colombia. Now, the area around here is rural and undeveloped, primarily, unless you count that super ancient stone wall there and bridge. Oh, my God. Look at that. It looks like Terabithia or... <laughs> Or it looks like not very modern American. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could see that in a scene from uh, Lord of the Rings. I really could. That particular angle and uh, all that. You know, it needs more color. There were mills in the 18th and 19th century which sat on the Columbia side of the river. And the bridge was known as the Cards Mills Bridge. With only one apostrophe, you figured out where it goes. And it provided transportation for mill business, as bridges are wont to do. Both of these towns, Columbia and Lebanon, are small towns typical of Eastern Connecticut, Lebanon being formed first in nation-wise and also town-wise. A 1695, they say, used to actually, Columbia, present-day Columbia, used to be part of Lebanon. It was incorporated as a town in 1700, about 100 years prior to Columbia, with this here 10 Mile River being part of the rather scenic boundary. And the mineral industry, primarily agricultural, there were some mills, grist mills, sawmills, and other small-scale industry mills, two mill sites are in the vicinity. Both of these towns are on the route from Hartford to Norwich, which were cities in 1784, making travel between them necessary, as all cities must connect to other cities lest they lose their title of city. Thus, this area was seasonal hunting for prehistoric and historic native peoples. You know what? Let's just talk about that term, prehistoric. What the hell does that mean? There's just history and then there's just history, right? I mean, what's prehistory? I understand it probably means pre-recorded history, but that would... Uh, that doesn't make sense, because if there's if it's not recorded, how could it exist? So yeah, stupid term. For both historic native peoples, we're gonna say possibly offered seasonal hunting or possibly other seasonal fin fish capture points, but we don't know because it was part of a large area which was used by Mohegan and Pequot people. Mohegan, I believe, often pronounced and spelled as Mohican as well, as in the one movie. 
Within a mile, <laughs> that's very specific, I know. You know what I'm talking about if you were alive in the 90s. Within about a mile radius of the bridge, there are Native American archaeological sites, which include temporarily diagnostic artifacts suggesting sightings from middle or late archaic through middle or late woodland periods, you know, 7,000 years ago. Well, 7,000 to 7,400 years ago, yeah under Mohegan control. And of course, it was deeded to settlers by the 1670s through some trickery, no doubt. There's a lot of historical dispute on the early settlers of the town of Lebanon, which gained a certain amount of notoriety during the American Revolution, as several important American revolutionaries, including George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, met there. So yeah, that's the, uh, the stories. It's constructed of rubble masonry, as you can tell, and the bridge is supposed to be erected near 1860. Later research, however, revealed that this bridge was not erected until the early 20th century. La later research is, uh, not detail. But maps first show a bridge here in 1869, so maybe that's what they're going off of. Now, this is a logical assumption, given that due to massive floods in the spring of 1869, many frame bridges were washed away, and more sturdy masonry bridges were built to replace them. A search of the town records, however, in Colombia and Lebanon for those years, however, yielded nothing! Colombia's records did not detail the expenses, but instead listed the following text. Bridge. And then the expense. Although bridges were built in the 1860s, there was never enough money allocated to a bridge to support the building of a masonry bridge. So, since no one assumes the ownership of it between the towns, and no one would, uh, no one assumes the notes explaining payment arrangements, no town notes are found. We even have record here from a town employee who performed a search in Lebanon and likewise came up with nothing. So that's three of us. There is, in 1909, however, a copy of bills sent to town of Lebanon on Cards Mills Bridge, old and new, which details the removal of an older frame bridge and a replacement by stone arch bridge, which possibly at the cost of $550, split between the two towns, 128 to 421, and some change, it seems that the... Hmm... Anyway, it seems that the bridge is not the bridge that is currently bridging today. You know, it's very unusual for a town, according to, uh, some guy named Bruce, for a town to go to the expense of building a masonry bridge, you know, because mill owners would sometimes contribute funds because the frame bridges were consistently washed out, and so, yeah, maybe the mills built them, but we'll never know! Because those stories exist in the past, and we, we live in the future. But there were sawmills in the area, so people who worked in the mills had to obviously get to work, lest they be written up, probably on parchment paper, in these early times. <laughs> <laughs> handed a red scroll. Likewise, in the case of grist mills and sawmills, customers who wanted service had to be able to get to the mills. Wow, this is such a insightful. And the shipping, I mean, wait a second. You're not shipping anything in this river. Look at that thing. What are you, what are you, unless you're like losing like poo sticks or leaf boats. What are you shipping down this river? Poppycock. Balderdash, says I. I guess they could be talking about a different river. We'll never know, because I've already turned the page. That's enough about bridge number 04619. I want to hear about this place with the whitewashed windows. Don't you? Well, if not, then why are you here? Is it for the various characters and make an appearance, such as this old crone here, who I managed to, I mean, who I managed to hire for this occasion, as uh, she used to live here, and I thought she'd give us some insight. Go ahead, old crone. Ah, oh, yes, murder. Murdoch Hill, the old Murdoch House, south of side of the old Clinton Road, a mile east of the old Horse Hill Road in Westbrook. I don't know the place well, though it hasn't been called that in many years. I once fixed a tank shop for a horse here, uh, for a woman named Elizabeth Fisher Reed. She died. The tank shop failed, probably because I just gathered up a bunch of roots from nearby lying shrubberies. I don't know, I'm not a witch, though I do appear to sound like one. You want to know more about the basement windows, do you, eh? Well, wouldn't you like to know? Look at those smiley faces. Just look at them. All right, beat it, old crone. You've been, you've given us nothing. We might have to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> you hear me, Jimmy and Billy? Wherever they may be, they too have abandoned me. Along with the rest of my imaginary friends. The Murdoch House was constructed in the second half of the 18th century by descendants of Captain John, you guessed it, Murdoch, an early settler in the Westbrook, or Saybrook as it was known at the time, area, which functioned as the domestic center of the small family farm until the third quarter of the 20th century. You got all that? Good. Elizabeth Fisher Reed, who did die, wow, the crone was right, the house was enlarged with two kitchen wings, and um, it was something called the 
salt meadow. The whole area. I don't know. Salt meadow. What it says, salt meadow. Now, the odd thing about it is, flooring is pine board, and the basement is concrete. Why is that funny? I don't know. You tell me. You tell me why it's funny. I, what I'm saying is, it, say, it sounds awfully like, uh, similar to the way we build houses today. With a concrete basement and a wooden upper floor. You think if the first floor was wood, that just seems odd. I don't know. But you know what I'm getting at, folks. You've been here a while. Maybe. What it's getting at is, I don't get it. I don't can get it, all right? I still don't get it. I'll never get it. What's the point of these fucking windows? Oh, it's for sunlight, sir. Really? Sunlight? Is that why they're so often boarded up or like covered in shrubs? Like, what kind of light would that even admit? Barely any. This seems rather low for a well. No? I mean, if you have children running around, they're fucked. You'd want it to be at least a little bit higher. And, uh, it just seems like this should be a two-story house with a basement. That's what it seems like to me. Which means that these stories are often wrong. Or, see there's a seller here, or the people that made them aren't being honest about how they came about them. This is an ancient Hansel and Gretel looking house. I'd be scared if I was there and I was a children. A child, a child. I really would. Lon. Go back. Jimmy, go back. Dude, hold still. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, that was my fault. What is that? I mean, it just seems odd to build a basement in this era. I don't know. Oh, there's a mid-house chimney. Hey, those two little things. Dude, we haven't seen those in a while. They were everywhere in California and Rhode Island, but Connecticut seemingly devoid of a lot of the fireplace pictures. This is, uh, it looks like brick, but it's actually linoleum, is what we're told in the write-up, so. So keep your conspiracy hats on a little longer, or, or take them off for a second. Interesting fireplace. Motifs and all that. Although rudely abused by the burning of wood. This is just a weird ass house. All these different materials and angles. It looks so patched on and added on. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh my god, the old crow herself! <laughs> oh dang, leave me out of the survey. I wasn't done speaking. Actually, that's not really... That's not really what I had in mind. She looks like a very nice lady. Uh, not the old crone that I was pretending to channel. <laughs> As if you couldn't tell. But look at this. Um, this cast iron work is really nice. And the whole place is really, uh, actually, these pictures kind of don't do it justice. I mean, it looks pretty beat down and such. Yeah, that entrance looks janky. You wonder if the brick was later or the random masonry was later. Oh, what is going on here? Very interesting place. Definitely, you know, modified a dillion times over the years. Is, which, if you don't know what a dillion is, I've explained it to you, but I guess I'll do it again. It's a one with a dillion zeros after it. Don't talk to me about made up numbers. Go make up your own. Then come back here. Then we'll have a nice cup of tea somehow and we'll discuss those numbers. It looks like a wind tower but alas, probably just a chimney because we're not in ancient Yemen. We're in ancient Connecticut. How does that even say? Ugh. Can this be just a house? No. No it cannot. This is St. Peter's Convent in Danbury built in 1895 to accommodate the nuns who taught in the parish's elementary school next door. Some nine 900 students at a time. It also has architectural significance with rounded arches, portico, decorative brickwork, and low hip roof typifying the Renaissance Revival style, and it's part of the Main Street Historic District of Danbury, which was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1983, which is around the time when they got to finally setting some of this stuff aside. Look at that millwork. Wow, beautiful. Three-story brick building. The large brick chimney rises above the copper-clad roof, which is amazing. There was a cupola, small central one which no longer exists, which provided attic ventilation, we're told. So it kind of was like a wind tunnel. Well, except I was talking about the chimney. So strike that. Sheltered by a flat-roofed wooden portico. Rusticated masonry in the first floor. That's what we're told, anyway. Looking a little foundationally challenged. Stenciling along the walls on a corner fireplace with elaborate mantle, stained glass windows in the first floor chapel, which has now been completely modernized, aka uglified, and the basement and the attic areas are unfinished. Unfinished, huh? Interesting why it would be unfinished after hundreds of years of existence, literally. In 1895, it was already too small, they say. So St. Peter's dynamic pastor, Henry Lynch, um, there were only 14 sisters in 1895, like the 14 fathers, but also four large classrooms for the school and the library, and immigrant families swelling the parish rolls. The school became inadequate in 1907. It had doubled in size, and so the school expanded yet again. John J. Dwyer of Hartford, Connecticut, was responsible for the building. He He'd build all the churches, schools, and other buildings for the ch Catholic Church, as well as the distinguished Renaissance Revival style Hartford Elks Club, of course. 
Leander Bolduc, or Bolduch, I don't know, built the thing in 1903. Now it will, modern day, fast forward to nowadays, it will be renovated in the, sorry, it'll be renovated in the future, which for us is the past, for use as senior citizen housing. Yeah, that doesn't look just pasted on. And the parish school, though it's still in operation, the teaching staff now consists of lay persons rather than nuns, because there can only be none. <laughs> The documentation was undertaken in accordance with the memorandum of agreement between the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office because, of course, they're going to f*** it all up, beat it all down, tear it all out, neutralize it, sterilize it, repurpose it, and they'll give you this snapshot, this little description that I just gave you. That's to suffice for the actual building because no one pays attention. And it won't be until 2024 when some nerd comes along and does a survey on YouTube that approximately four people see that this will be known about. Look at the fireplace. He's fucking screaming. He's like, bah! Normally I draw the eyes on, but you get it. All doors to the hall. All doors to the hall. Spare no expense here in this. Look at the accommodations. And look at this one. Not even a bed. I'd be willing to bet mm, a substantial amount of crypto currency that this hallway has the distinct odor of urine in it just by sight that's my superpower i can look down a hallway and know whether or not it's been peed in <laughs> It's funny, it's a superpower that you can't can never be confirmed because I'm not there and you know, you're not there. Ugh. From the pent, from the urine drenched hallways of St. Peter's Convent, allegedly, which I allege, I do, can't take that away from me, to the new Canaan, as in Canaanites, railroad station. That's oh, why the city named New Canaan in Connecticut. I can't figure it out. Can you? Okay. Mm. We'll continue. Built in 1868, the New Canaan Railroad Station is significant as one of the last remaining registers of the New Canaan Railroad. It is also one of the earliest surviving railroad stations in Connecticut. The accompanying cane train sheds or train survivors are. <laughs> All right, the accompanying train sheds are rare survivors in the state. Its Gothic Revival style architecture is not a mode usually employed in train station design in the state, making the station even more significant. Can't. <laughs> and look at those vending machines selling all that candy. Candy canes, perhaps? I see a little bit of the decor left or left on there and that one vagrant, but well, not much of uh not much is left. I don't know what they're talking about. You know, how significant could it be when you just beat the thing down? I mean, there you go. And it's a sharp looking building, that's for sure. Anything else about it? No, 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 no. no. That's all you get, Sonny. That's all you get. So that leaves the rest to a reckless speculation. And there's the detail. The last bit of detail that we love so well. It does look sharp, but it also looks like a replacement for stuff that was there earlier. You heard me? And those are cramped quarters. That floor creaks. I can tell you that much. It really does. I mean, I can hear it. You know what I'm talking about. Man, it's so funny with these old offices. Like, you can just... Maybe I'm having sensory issues, but you can just hear the sound of that door closing, you know? And just, if you were to walk in there, you just know what that office smells and feels like. Isn't that strange? Life goes on and you just have these patterns. I'm proud of you, Surveyor, for crawling up that ladder and getting in that attic and doing your due diligence just so we could see them that shoddy wire work. I really am. Good job, dude. That's some thorough surveillance. Wowie wowie. And what I mean by that is, look at those friggin' sconces. Or land. Oh, those things are massive, dude. They ain't making those nowadays. No siree. This is an old world gem. What are we looking at here, Jimmy? We're looking at the Stanford, not Stan, Stam Ford Post Office. Of course. Couldn't belong to a private party with a bold world banger like that. No sorry, Bob Scabelli. This here Stanford Post Office was designed in 19... Get the f*** out of here, Wires. 1914 and completely 1916. So a year and a half or so. And uh, let's find out more. The date of res erection was, well, 1909. Mr. Ebenezer J. Hill introduced legislation to erect a building to house the post office and other federal government office in Stanford. Okay, okay. The architect of the, uh, well, it was an agency, we're told, in control of the design. It was the office of the supervising architect of the treasury located in D.C., a vast architectural enterprise with over 253 architects, engineers, and draftsmen, larger than the entire Department of State in Washington, which is ridiculous. Larger than the State Department in Washington was this architectural supervising architect of the tre- Get the f*** 
fuck out of here. Who even heard of this thing? Anyway, they built 80 buildings a year and expanded, and they supervised the architect with Oscar Wenderoth, who was trained in Philadelphia before he came to work there in 1897 as a senior draftman, transferred immediately back to Philadelphia to work on the U.S. Mint, and he left to work for Elliot Woods, the architect of the Capitol on the new House and Senate office buildings, becomes head draftsman in 1909, called upon in 1912 to supervise this. Yes, so, I mean, what the hell's going on? The work... Under his rule, the work at the office has been characterized as being decorative expressions of the Beaux-Arts style. And uh, he achieved this high-level design even though he became supervising architect just before the passage of the Public Buildings Act of the Year of Our Lord, 1913, which is one of the shittiest years in American history, which called for the creation of standardized plans for post offices and tied the size and elaborateness of designs to the number of postal receipts. Okay, so agreed to comply with standardization of heating, ventilation, sanitary work, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to focus my staff's energy on creating correct and perfect architectural models, he's known for saying. He also demanded more entrances and additional amenities. No two post office sites should be identical, he's known for saying in a fit of rage alone in his office while throwing crumpled pieces of paper at the wall. A secretary, who shall not be named, slyly gave us this information written down on a hat that she passed underneath the table to me at a nearby cocktail lounge while I was seducing her for information. See, I can make shit up too. This is rather, really a, a lovely post office though. I mean, it really is. All jokes aside and completely true stories that I just said or didn't say, aside. Now, before this, Stanford's post office was usually located in some form of private house on Post Road. After the revolution, this trend continued with the first official post office located in a grocery store. Okay, hold on. A private house is where they existed first. Then this trend continued with the first official post office being in a grocery store. That's not a private house. Then it moved to a stage house and stage yard. And in 1853, it moved to a building on Main Street. Then it moved again 30 years later to the old town hall. At this point, three clerks were required and house-to-house -house delivery was established. And then the town hall, of course, burned down in 19. So eventually it took up quarters in a series of buildings on Main Street. And then finally, aforementioned Congressman Ebenezer J. Hill kept it real and demanded that this be built. A wonderful place from which to view parades and a convenient location to deposit mail. As one would expect from any place who functioned solely to deliver mail. So that's the story. And I'd love to know more about those freaking massive lanterns, but I'm sure they exist from a time prior to this where things like that were normal. Massive doorways and stuff, and massive lanterns, and massive steps. There it is up close. Good golly wackles, what a gorgeous thing. And just look behind it. The, the contrast between that absolute sh air conditioner with like, what, plastic f***ing falling? I mean, what the f*** is that? Progress, my butt. Pardon my language, but this is just unbelievable. Uh, the dichotomy here is just uh, slippery. Yes, I agree. These lies are. And looking very grand for a post office. Very unnecessarily grand. What means these giant windows if you're just gonna put this little donkey booth in there? I mean, it's so stupid. Even those are just beautiful boxes. File in. File in. And, uh, yeah. A beautiful building. Look at those columns. Just gorgeous. What is this, like some back room? You're gonna take these columns, you're gonna surround them with these drop-down acoustic panels. Like, what a f***ing joke, man. Look at this. The, uh, photographer must be wondering, hey, what the hell's this? <laughs> I'm gonna take a picture of this little uh, archway that you guys smothered up. Oh, the vault. Ugh, what'd they do to it? God, these back rooms are just trash. Can you imagine taking such a beautiful building and just filling it full of just junk like this? I mean, I understand this is the mail, but that just looks so dumpy. Oh, there it is being built. My gosh. Look at that. Let's see. We got scaffolding. Um, it looks like a rope ladder. It's just a bunch of tangled up. What is this? Like, it looks like a Ferris wheel. It's been all bent. Up, uh, and the building is complete. I mean, the building is f***ing complete. There's even glass in the windows, it looks like. It looks like there's a reflection of, like, trees. I mean, maybe not. Maybe you're looking into the building, but this bad boy is done. Okay, if you needed any more proof that this is bullshit, look at this tree right here. Like, what? what is this? Why is there a tree growing so close to the building? Actually, you can't even see. Like, why would you, why would you build around? Like, the scaffolding and the roof are literally encompassing this tree. Why would you do that? 
died. Why would you dig this basement knowing you're going to hit these tree roots, uh, which are as big above b below as they are above? Why? Why? No, this is just framing drawn on or pasted on around uh, this building. I mean, I bet upon closer examination, these shadows aren't even proper. This is the kind of stuff that we're talking about. One, and you got these two guys looking on like, wow, look at it. Look at it just build itself there. This is just ridiculous. And you got to park the one car nearby, which you'd never do if it was under construction. You would never park your vehicle right by the, I mean, this is just retarded. And it's just always the one picture. And then you go, oh, oh, we're done. Oh, look at that. We're done. Yeah, there's the tree. Yeah, we just built around it. Yeah, that's right. It's so normal for us to build this lopsided foundation around this tree here. Yep, yep, yep. That looks like uh, exactly something that would normally be done. Get the hell out of here. They dug this building up, it looks like. I mean, what a joke. Oh, and this is proof. More proof, huh? More proof of what? It's just piles of dirt coming from the basement areas? What is this proof of? Man, I'm sorry to get so animated, but this is stupid. This is stupid. You would plant these trees later, yeah, but that's not what we saw, is it? No, those trees were there first. Okay, fine. Refinishing the floor and cleaning it up. Yeah, that's fine. That makes sense. Hanging some lighting, I guess. The efforts that they go to to try to prove this stuff is just stupid. Here you have a perfectly completed building, perfectly fine brickwork, and all this being straight excavated. It's not being built, let's say general, federal. I'm sure they are laying new pipes. I'm sure they are doing electricity, but the idea that this little can buggy. What is it? Well, look at this. What is this buggy thing? And then this, with its very modern looking wheels and vans. This is not, these pictures make no sense. Here we got what? This is in the 40s, it looks like? 30s? And what? Uh, you're just adding on to it, I guess? Are they trying to claim that they built, that it took 20 years to build? Because here we were told it was built in like 1909. So what is this? Don't let the comment build a wall here. Don't let the common folks see down there. See how complete it already is. I don't know, man. This just seems like a big fucking joke. And I'm not laughing, America. Well, not at your jokes, anyway. This is the Terry homestead. Who's Terry? Well, which Terry? Because Terry's a last name here. Several generations of Terrys have lived here. Allegedly built in 1748 by a man named Barnes. And finally, Samuel Terry got it in the 1828, who was a clockmaker. And his son, Ralph Terry, and grandson, Franklin Terry, both became clockmakers as well. And they played a role in the small but vibrant industrial city, the undisputed center of the American clock industry in the 19th and 20th centuries. How about that? 1903, they started making glass cutters with Fred Fletcher, first in a barn at the rear of the house and then in the brick factory. And the company prospered and remains in business to this day. In 1973, it was made use by this company, Bristol Historical Society, which as you can tell, has taken great pains in keeping uh, the property in absolutely wonderful condition, as well as being open for business nearly every day of the year, except for any day that you're going there. It's just a coincidence. Damn, look at the mustache on that mug. <laughs> that is some effort. I like handlebars, bro. No telling which Terry that one is. But quite a cool little place. Clock on the mantle, there better be. And, uh, what have we here? No, thank you. No, no, no. No, thank you. Wow, it looks rather, um, I don't know, lived in for a historical society? I don't know. Must have just preserved this weird way. Guys, I know where the safe is. <laughs> Surveyor gave it away, dude. It's gonna be the easiest job ever, dude. The survey doing the casing for us, bro. And this, uh, clearly not in use. Pizza works. Damn. Does sound good right now. Ugh. Might need to cut this one short. Well, this is the old Saybrook Railroad Station, and there's a few things to say about it, of which I will dutifully uh, say, I guess. This is old Saybrook, uh, a stopping place. It's not known when the first station building was made or how close it was to the existing station. How could it be the first station building if it... <laughs> If there's an existing station, this is the kind of crap that I don't understand. Maybe my uh, English mastery isn't, but whatever. 1913, there's a historic photograph that shows the junction in its original configuration without the pizza work sign. At least you couldn't tell that from the map. Around World War I, the New Haven began an extensive construction program to electrify the territory between New Haven and New York, which replaced a lot of stations and towers with distinctive Spanish Revival style masonry designed by F.W. Melor. The New Haven Railroad chose to retain this old building rather than replace it. So it was all for 1936. Some of the buildings were removed, and at some point, presumably, 
a wood-fired pizza kitchen was added. Otherwise, the pizza works sign on the outside is a friggin' lie and made me hungry for no reason. This building is, I doubt, in service in any capacity. It's the interlocking tower, though. I will tell you that. The levers are kept on the second floor. Built in 1912, to replace a tower that was already demolished in a derailment, smashed it to pieces. Go relays and switches we've seen before. The towers closed in the 70s because the centralization of the computers and the electrical equipment was removed somewhat, leaving only all these these switches. Good. God! Just look at that beauty. This is the St. Anne Rectory, and it was built in 1894 and completed in 1895. Designed by Louis Destremps of Massachusetts. This man was born in near Montreal, came to the United States as a young man, lived in Pittsfield and then Woonsocket, Rhode Island, moved to Fall River, worked as a carpenter. Three years later, moved to St. John's, New Brunswick, worked as a carpenter in 1881, moved to New York City, where at the age of 30, enrolled in Sixth Avenue High School's architectural program, following his graduation, returned to Fall River and designed buildings. His long and prolific career produced numerous designs for church-related buildings, as well as for dwellings of wealthy residents of Fall River, and the architect for some of the earliest buildings at the Rhode Island State Agricultural College, though I don't recall call during our Rhode Island survey ever coming across that name before. I could be wrong, but I'll have to go back and look, Mr. Destrimps. And this looking like with all the usual weirdness of the foundation, you know, we got the same kind of questions as before. Uh, but, um... This was an ambitious initiative undertaken by St. Anne's charismatic second pastor, Reverend Joseph Edouard Boré. In 1890, he took over, bought a property, built the first church, which is a wooden structure. Within three years, paid off a $30,000 debt somehow, even though working as a father or a pastor. Started a school in an unused public school building. That'd be weird for an unused public school building to exist in 1890. But uh, in 1894, um, he, was, he was no longer able to spare the room for the parochial school. So instead, he turned uh, to this architect and, um, you know, decided to build a new school, a new residence for the priests, who now numbered a whole two, and a convent for eight teachers. Uh, he did this because he wanted to make sure that none but Waterbury workmen should be employed, and that way the city's unemployed would have access to the construction jobs. Uh, he painted a picture of the parish as a confident and growing organization and based off this picture this bad boy was constructed and based off that picture too and look at those ceilings just freaking look at the paneling look at this beautiful building unbelievable catholic church you crooks I know how you do it with these coffered ceilings and these I know how you pulled it off but i mean even just to make these sort of ceilings and wall panelings today it looks like they've been removed in here yeah they definitely have look at that they took them right off you could see the squares how sad I wonder what they did with them they're probably inside the priest's home which now number three certainly the priests need their own mansion look at that bad boy Holy golly wackles. That's like a uh, the male version of those furnaces that I hit on. So I'll, I'll tip my cap to you, sir, but I, I'll take it no further. And what do we have here? Brief stop yeah. here, uh, Joe, and take a look at Deep this river, here deeper. survey. Let's learn about this Penfield uh -huh. Reef Lighthouse, if you don't mind. It's got an interesting shape for a lighthouse. That it do. A mansard roof and everything. 1874 was the construction date. It was the last waterbound masonry lighthouse constructed in the United States before they switched to cast iron materials in 1870. It's second empire design, I know it, reflecting the national enthusiasm for revival architectural styles. Uh-huh. Second empire meaning, you know, mansard roof.
roof. I wonder how they got electricity out there, you know? I mean, I guess it could have had its own generator, but in 1874, and that's unlikely. Power plants weren't even around until 1899, so. Stands in five feet of water, making a bedrock reef at the end of a narrow mud shoal, which extends southeast from Fairfield Beach in Connecticut into the Long Island Sound. Um, first story is a granite masonry. The light tower is six, seven feet and six inches square and octagonal at the level of the watch room above. All the windows have been blocked off with steel panels. The original wood doors have been blocked off with steel panels. And galvanized metal sheeting covers the lantern gallery deck. So it was one of the most ex uh, elaborate designs by the U.S. Lighthouse Board during the period, we're told. Significant in the history of aids to navigation, important part of the federal program after the Civil War, directing traffic around Bridgeport Harbor. The first permanent lighthouse in the area, well, not really in the area, but it was Boston Harbor Little Brewster Island, 1716. The new London Harbor Light was 1760. It was the first permanent lighthouse erected in the Long Island, or on the Long Island Sound. And this was, this area, this little, you know, it's a narrow mud shoal, was a significant hazard for ships entering and leaving Bridgeport. They tried to mark this shoal with an inadequate unlit can-type buoy that did little to warn the ships, as an unlit buoy would do. Finally, in 1866, enough hullabaloo was raised to warrant this appropriations and it was took two years to make 1871 to 1873 we're told that uh, by the time it was built the technology was already superseded by the more cost effective methods of prefabricated cast iron components which is what we normally see uh, initially it just had a fog bell struck by machinery it was heard 15 or 20 miles away it was replaced in 1892 by a trumpet operated by hot air engines and then those engines were replaced by oil engines and then finally a fourth order lens a bull eye lens run by clockwork manufactured in the lamp shop at Tompkinsville, New York, was in operation by 1899, and that lasted but until 1971, when all of that was replaced by robots, or, you know, computers. Rather beat down on the interior. Really cool looking old building, though. And brick, of course. Brick construction, as we're told. This is an interesting lighthouse. I don't think I've seen one quite like this in all of my surveys. What about you? Have you seen them in all of my surveys? <laughs> all papers to the fourth floor. All loose papers and documents to the fourth floor. All overturned carts and cardboard remnants to the fifth floor. All overturned carts and cardboard and components to the fifth floor. This is a sad demise of the Ives Toy Factory. Electrical trains and things made here. Now nothing is made here but jokes from my Brian. And here we have some of the fine local art that has taken place over the years. Really, the youth of uh, yesteryear are to be commended. And that's where you'll be sleeping, Jennifer. Dinner is at eight. Don't be late. Ugh. I don't know if Jennifer's gonna make it out of that one. That's a, that's a real doozy. And here we have another very interesting lighthouse here. Wow, and these last two lighthouses, very old world looking indeed. I like that. This is the Stratford Shoal Lighthouse. And I'll briefly talk about it. Gravel Shoal in the middle of the Long Island Sound, south, seven miles south of Bridgeport. 1877 is what the carved stone plaque between the first and second story windows says. So we're gonna run with that date. 1877. It's a five level tower, though. Well, yeah, it does look like it. I guess the size of scale is this little kind of, it looks like a little miniature from here, but been unoccupied since 1970. 1873, 1872 is when it was designed. Basically opened up a ring, laid a concrete pad. The construction is composed of huge blocks of granite backed with concrete. With great difficulty, completed by D.V. Howell in 1874. The stone was provided by M.K. Chase a Connecticut stone supplier, shipped from granite quarries, stockpiled on a nearby temporary wharf, and the construction schooner, the Mignonette, actually sank during this construction. Because of a, a storm broke her moorings, the men and supplies were saved and remained at the site where they were housed in the nearly completed lighthouse. This was in 1878. They hid inside until, I guess, another ship could be sent out to them? I don't know. It doesn't talk about any more of that. This just basically plays a vital role in guiding ships away from the hazardous middle ground shoal. The original lighting apparatus was a Frenier lens. Oh, hard word. Flashed every 30 seconds. 1879. 
They changed it every 15 seconds. The following year, they added a trumpet and a caloric engine, a new win, a new lens in 1894, replaced in 1905 by a fourth order flashing light, a Clayton air compressor for an improved trumpet were installed, and in 1919, a first class air siren was added. In 1970, they added a 600,000 candle power light, which was visible for 13 miles. Which is odd, if you take the Earth curvature into consideration. And they also automated it fully, and in 1978 they changed it to battery, and now no humans exist on it, but it continues to perform the function for which it was designed, at least that was the write-up at the time. Hi. Lord knows if it's still in use, but Jiminy, that's a beautiful lighthouse. I would love to occupy, live in a lighthouse for a year or two, operate it, uh, guide tours, whatever it took. That would be just a, I would love to do that. I really would. So if you're listening, lighthouse guy, <laughs> and you got the hookup on the lighthouse living situation, hit me up on the Blackberry. Look at that one. It's even got a nice little house. Oh man, so cool. Yeah, like this guy right here. And yeah, I know it's a guy, because look at the freaking Budweiser, a giant Budweiser. Yeah, that's that's like a piggy bank or something. Yeah, no woman has that. Show me the woman that has that and all these German beer steins, which actually, wow, that's a great collection. Probably worth some money there. If you're in the selling of beer steins industry, I've sold a few steins myself. Wait a second, look at that. What do we got down here? Look at this guy's a this guy is a guy. I could be that guy. I could be that guy, dude. Perched in my ivory tower. What a glorious life for a year or two. Till the snow and the storms really get you. Great Captain's Island, huh? I want to be that great captain. Look at that one. It's covered in junk. Oh, someone straightened it out real quick. Nope, the junk's back. <laughs> well, I don't know what's going on with that one. Ooh, looks like someone's... Look at that. Behind the uh, so-called prefabricated parts, it's fucking brick. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Thought so. Oh, well, I guess it's not that much of a mystery. But yeah, clearly much older than what they tried to pass it off as, considering it's just all old-ass brick. And they covered up with, you know, precast steel plates and all that stuff. Another massive industry probably gone to waste. Oh, Connecticut, you've got visitors from Pennsylvania. You better take care of that. This just looks like every industry building everywhere, really. An old cistern. Look at that brick just t popping up here. What do you got? Somebody's out here. What, tree roots messing stuff up kind of looks like it um like what would do that what would make the bricks pop up like that other than like an earthquake or i guess tree roots that's very bizarre how why is that happening i don't think i've ever seen anything like that this calls for further investigation i know i'm a little overstaying my welcome a little bit this time but there is a reason for that this is a bearing plant actually a fafner bearing plant built in 1880 there was uh, about a half a dozen ball bearing manufacturers that dominated world production on ball bearings if you believe it or not, in the first half of the 20th century, that were all from Connecticut. Uh, Marlon Rockwell, Norman Hoffman, uh, this one's just Fafnir, as I said. Significant in the development of aerospace, agriculture, precision machine, and uh, such and such. Modern bearings satisfying the need for greater strength, greater speeds, fan blades, propellers, rotors, axles, moving parts, all sorts of industry. Founded by Howard S. Hart, his friends called him Howard Shart, whose inspiration for the venture came during the ultimately unsuccessful attempt by American Hardware to produce and market the Corbin automobile between 1908 and 1912. All the ball bearings that they needed from Germany and England led Hart to form this company named after a sorcerer's dragon. What the frick? Named after a sorcerer's dragon in Wagner's opera Siegfried. How would you name a ball bearing manufacturing plant after a sorcerer's dragon? That's odd. But whatever, this nerd obtained a license in 1913 under the Conrad patents that formed the basis for modern ball bearing manufacture. Interrupting the flow of German made bearings, obviously, was World War I. Uh, Ford and Dodge were the prime consumers of these. And they added all these buildings over the years as they expanded. Uh, it was a 13 acre site. 29 separate buildings, 598,000 square feet. Uh, 25 of these buildings joined to each other. Uh, very strange. Now, all of the manufacturing equipment, office furniture has been removed. They left the air conditioning behind, the pumps for the oils and the solvent. And after eight years only, the electrical equipment, the heating registers, the air conditioners have all been vandalized. The glass partitions have all been broken. Plastic panels have been removed or broken, and groundwater has flowed into the building, which I'm assuming must be what the cause of those bricks. Look at that. I mean, that massive industry just gone. And why did it exactly 
out of business. One would like to know, presumably the competition? I mean, having that many, or was it that Germany? So apparently, after World War II and into the 70s, in the 30s, they were thriving, and in support of the war effort, they had 168 hour work weeks. Jesus, how's that even possible? And apparently after the war effort, bye bye. Oddly enough, there's literally nothing about the demise of the company or the abandonment of the plant. It just simply says, Torrington Company vacated the site in 1988. Numerous attempts were made to market the property for reuse. Okay, and it will be demolished. So it's gone now. Demolished all of it for uh, an urban enterprise zone, which probably just means miles of suburbia. What the frick? Wow, look at that. That's incredible. You just gotta wonder, what do they do with stuff like this? They can't tell me they just rip it out and destroy it and waste it. I mean, that is fantastic. Look at that. The, the design and these old industrial works, especially the cast iron stuff, was just absolutely remarkable. It's a wonder that we just make the ugliest crap today. I mean, do computers just make everything ugly? I think they do. They really make everything just ugly. It's like they've got no style, no grace, nothing, no artisanship. It's just, it's all like an iPhone now. The world is like an iPhone. You know, it's like, pay no attention to the ugly circuits underneath. Just look at the glossy exterior. Don't worry about how it works. It's like Windows. You know, real computers, when they run, run on you know, DOS mode, just the, just the letters and the coding the program is ugly but look at this you point and click and uh it's pretty and it's simple ignore the inner workings i feel like that's the world is sort of like that but back in the day it was a celebrated industry it was like look at these damn ball bearings look at this ferris wheel look at this industry they can make it just uh, at least you know you might not be into it but it's a celebration of of uh you know, we did it this engineering you know which is an remarkable achievement our brains were given to us for a reason i believe to create free estonia yes i agree and, um, you know, they were proud of it. They were very proud of it. And I'm sure construction workers are, and engineers today are proud of what they do, as they should be. But it's not celebrated. It's not, it's not in the forefront. It's not, um, it's glossed over and forgotten and, and unencouraged. Uh, it's just amazing to me to, that anyone could feel like we are in the state of progress. Like, yeah, we are progressing, but I don't think we're progressing humanity. We are advancing the progression of something else, something insidious, essentially our takeover, our replacement. We're just grooming our... It's like when you train your own replacement at work, and that's what we're doing. It's very, um... Very disturbing, to say the least. Look at that guy. He's, he, is that actually a graffiti of a ball bearing? That'd be interesting. More of the local art on display here. Steph, Jerry, Jeff, and Dan. You guys, you incriminated yourselves. It's an interesting little rune there. And of course, we end up here. How could we not end up with some bridges? And folks, that wraps up the Connecticut survey. Look at that old world wonder. Golly, it's beautiful. This is followed from the engineering record here at the end. Uh, wow, another lighthouse from the Second Empire. Look at that mansard roof. Well, there's like a floating house out there. How bizarre is that? And um, it's been a lot longer than I anticipated, Connecticut. I really did, and I didn't, would not have guessed this would have stretched to 14 episodes and thousands of bridges and lighthouses galore. This old world stuff, but man, that was uh, that was very interesting. I personally feel like I learned a lot about the region. I didn't know. I've never been actually to Connecticut. I recently received a invitation to visit a site. Oh, look at that star for. Holy crap. What is that? Look at that. Star for right there. And I'm sure you residents know all about that. Actually, Great Island. What did I hear from that? Oh, you know what that? So I recently received an invitation um, from someone to visit a place out here called Great Island uh, before they destroy it. Apparently it's only had one owner. One family owned the majority of it and, and the buildings are of the type that we, we labeled, you know, Tartarian or from that from that era and I I suppose I should have responded via the email but if you're out there I would abs I'm thrilled to receive the invitation and I would absolutely love to but I I'm not located anywhere near Connecticut despite the survey here showing some familiarity with the area it's not really it's just learned it's just learned from reading all phones to the sixth floor all phones to the sixth floor but i do appreciate it and i would love if you are able to even take some photographs and send them to me i would love to to put them on display here and and uh and do a little episode just about that that kind of stuff is amazing and this world uh you know this stuff is fading fast fading fast and who knows how long things like this will even be available online look at that an old world wonder so many bridges 
Connecticut. You've really blown my bridge brain. And a lot of these are from the engineer. Oh, wow, look at the construction on that. Like the flagstone, the, the stacking. That's just so, it looks so dangerous. But um, I bet it's just withstood the test of time in an incredible way. And a lot of these we've we've done in the past, these bridges. This, this the end of these surveys, they tend to kind of go gloss over old uh, things we've already been through as the engineering record kind of doesn't overlap and stuff. So that's why I'm, I'm not really touching on these too much. Many of these we've already uh, already covered. What a beautiful, what a beautiful area. What a cool uh, part of the world. What a really cool part of the country. I just, well, I would love to visit and just stroll around and, and poke around some of these old, these old things, you know? I mean, if you're in Europe, this is nothing. This is a common place, but here, from what we're told, our new world, our young world, this is as old as it gets, and it's fascinating. In the absence of any actual parting wisdom, I leave you with this. And, and I'll, I'll see you soon.